All right, you guys, thank you so much again for inviting me into your home to talk about the Mediterranean diet. I hope everybody is doing well. Um, I wanted to talk about the Mediterranean diet because, you know, we talk a lot about foods that are part of the Mediterranean diet, but, you know, is there proof that this is really the be all end all and should we all be following this diet? And what exactly is the Mediterranean diet? When I ask my patients that, they, they get some of it, but they don't understand all of it. So I wanted to talk about it. So we'll know what it's all about. You know, should we follow it? And if we do, how do you start? So I wanted to teach a concept called mind mapping. And this is a technique that I use for some of my patients in education. Um, and it's pretty cool. And it, it really does help people decide what foods might fall within the Mediterranean diet paradigm. And it just helps them. So I wanted to introduce it to you today. Of course, I always put this quote up because it's like my favorite quote, our food should be our medicine and our medicine should be our food. And it's so absolutely true. I mean, in this day and age where there are vaccine, vaccines and gene therapy and drugs and all this stuff, if we can just go back to healthy, wholesome, whole foods, I think we really, really would be better off. When you think about all the junk that is in our food supply, it's just a crime. It just really is between genetically modified modified foods, preservatives, dyes, um, pesticides, herbicides. I mean, we can go on and on and on. Um, if there is any way that you can create your own little garden, that would be great. But even the seeds that you buy are genetically modified. So you'd have to get heirloom seeds, you know, but, you know, we got to do the best we can. That's what I say. And the reason why we have to do the best we can is, I know this is from 2019, but this, this data is still true. The number one cause of death in the United States and globally is still heart disease followed by stroke. So when you look at what these diseases are, heart disease, stroke, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, infections, all right, we'll skip over neonatal conditions, trachea, bronchus and lung cancers, Alzheimer's disease, dementias, diarrheal diseases, diabetes mellitus, kidney disease. Every single one of these conditions, except maybe the neonatal conditions, is linked to either poor nutrition or can be treated through good nutrition. So, you know, that's really, really important. It's just so sad that we have, you know, the American Heart Association, we have all these, this education on what we should be doing to keep our heart healthy, and yet we still have heart disease being number one. So these are the leading 20th healthiest countries. And again, this was 2019 data. I tried to look up uh, more recent, but it wasn't published. Um, and as you can see, do you see the United States here? Okay, I don't see the United States here. That is pretty sad. So Spain, I believe that I've been to Spain, they've got a beautiful diet, Spain, Italy, Iceland, Japan, Switzerland, Sweden, Australia, Singapore, Norway, Israel. Okay, so what could be a common food um, with these countries? Well, seafood, they're not landlocked countries here, seafood, vegetables, fruits, whole grains, legumes, um, you know, lots, and even here in some of these Asian countries, they, they actually have a more of a plant-based diet than an animal diet. Um, South Korea, it's New Zealand, United Kingdom. I was really actually surprised that the United Kingdom actually made it onto this list because they're like number four or five with obesity. So this country, unfortunately, just like the United States is having a really hard time with, with overweight and obesity in their population. But we need to eat more like Spain and Italy and Iceland and Japan. So even though Japan's not Mediterranean per se, their, their foods are very similar to the Mediterranean diet. All right, so what is the research on the Mediterranean diet? Is it actually healthy? Well, there is research to show, and I didn't put all the research studies here. I didn't want it to be boring, but it does prevent heart disease and strokes. Well, that's good since that's the number one cause of death. The, the foods that are within the Mediterranean diet are heart healthy. Um, it keeps you agile, agile in the sense that it helps to maintain muscle mass. A lot of the omega-3s help with arthritis conditions, help to keep cartilage healthy. Um, so yes, it does keep you agile. Does it reduce the risk of Alzheimer's? Yes, we actually, there is actually the MIND diet, which is a modification of the Mediterranean diet, which has been shown to decrease some of those plaques that develop in the brain that lead to um, Alzheimer's. Um, same thing with Parkinson's disease. So the antioxidants that we're finding in the fruits and the vegetables and even in the glass of wine actually help to reduce the risk of Parkinson's disease. 
hopefully it's increasing longevity. And on the whole point of longevity is to be as healthy as we possibly can. You know, it is a crapshoot with our genes. We can't control that, but you want to do the best you can because as we get older, just the natural aging process kind of sets things back a little bit. So you want to be a healthy 90 year old and a healthy 95 year old, et cetera. Does it protect against type two diabetes, diabetes, uh, diabetes and obesity? And I would say yes, just because it is high in fiber. And if you are eating high fiber, we're supposed to be eating less. Um, it also has less processed foods. And this is a type of diet that I do recommend for my patients that or clients that want to lose weight. We kind of use the foundation of a Mediterranean diet. Now, there are some myths about the Mediterranean diet. Some people say to me, oh, man, I don't know if I can follow it. It just costs so much. I can't go out and you know, buy salmon every other day. Um, but when you, when you really do go shopping, there are some things that are very budget friendly. Uh, plant proteins like the legumes and the lentils. I mean, you can buy a whole huge bag for under $5. Um, frozen vegetables, frozen fruits, it doesn't necessarily have to be fresh. And believe it or not, some of the frozen in, when you do the nutritional evaluation on these products, they're actually higher than even the fresh stuff. And that kind of makes sense because when you think about it, the frozen stuff is picked and harvested and then blast pretty much right away. Whereas a lot of these products that are sitting on the shelves, you know, the lettuce and the, the you know, the tomatoes, they're sitting out there in those ultraviolet lights and the air and the oxygen and who knows how long it's actually been sitting there. And you know what, there is something really wrong with a tomato that just doesn't rot for like two or three weeks. I'm not kidding. I bought a package of tomatoes and I didn't even touch them for three weeks. I just <laughs> didn't get around to eating them. They're still good. That's not normal. Okay, that's not normal. I grew up um, where my mom would have a tomato farm and we had so many tomatoes. But if you didn't eat those tomatoes pretty quick, they were rotten by like two days. So what is on those tomatoes that that's keeping it's like shellac or something they just don't die I don't know there's something weird about that. Myth number two, if one glass of wine is good for your heart, then three glasses is three times as healthy. Well, no, we know that. You guys have been to my lectures long enough to know that we really still have to, um, if we, we're going to drink alcohol, and if we drink wine, which has been shown um, to help the heart in a certain way, you can't overdo it. You still have to stay within your moderation. Eating large bowls of pasta and bread is the Mediterranean way? Well, no, <laughs> it's not. As a matter of fact, a lot of the pasta is used as a side dish and the pasta is usually a whole grain. Do they eat bread? Of course they eat bread, but again, smaller portions, I think it's about serving sizes as well. And then the Mediterranean diet is only about the food. No, actually the Mediterranean diet is more of a philosophy. It, it includes a lot more than just the food. It's a way of life. It's incorporating exercise. It's incorporating social time. It's incorporating meditation. It's incorporating family, uh, culture. So it's pretty in depth. Now, this is just a just a nice food guide pyramid just to see, okay, so what should we be eating on the Mediterranean diet? And I'm going to show you, I do it a little bit differently. I, sh I show this chart, but as you can see, as you go up the pyramid, you're supposed to be eating less. That's how it works. So the first rung of the pyramid is physical activity and social time. So the Mediterranean diet really puts credence on not just physical activity, but also social. It's so important. So that's why I really appreciate when you guys come to my workshop, it's a chance that we can get together and be social and learn something. And it's so important if you guys, you know, play your card games or your board games or you have your book clubs, that is just so important to stay engaged and stay social. And I think that's why COVID has just really, really hit us in such a terrible way. Um, mental illness, isolation, suicide, all of that has gone up because of this COVID pandemic. So it's just wreaked more havoc than just the physical part. Um, again, the base of the Mediterranean diet is really to incorporate a plant-based diet, which means a plethora of fruits, vegetables, and whole grains. So it's not vegetarian per se, but it's plant-centered. Um, and if you're going to do proteins, we would prefer the fish and the seafood. Now, of course, that's controversial too, because there's a lot of pollution. You know, we, we would you know, we're, we're always saying like we, when I say nutritionists, nutritionists would prefer if you could do wild caught salmon and 
wild caught swordfish and things like that. But unfortunately, our oceans are getting polluted. But when you compare it to farm raised just because of the farming technique, it's getting better. It's getting a lot better. But there were some reports that there was a lot of contamination in a lot of these farm raised fish just because of the farming technique. But because there was light brought onto that, it's gotten much, much better. Poultry, eggs, cheese, and yogurt. So we're moving up the rung here. And it's really interesting when you look at the American diet, the American diet, we love our cheese. Let me tell you, this cheese is more on the bottom rung. <laughs> we're eating a lot of cheese. Um, we're even eating a lot of chicken too. And that, you know, chicken, you know, if you're doing chicken, I would hope that you would try to choose, if you can, the, the free range chicken, maybe chickens that are kosher or organic, um, things that are not pumped up with so many hormones. It doesn't seem normal that a chicken breast should be the size of a turkey breast. That just doesn't seem right to me as a nutritionist, right? Chickens and turkeys are two different types of fowl. So chickens are smaller. And, you know, I always smile because I live here in Southwest Ranches. So I live, you know, around some farmland, <laughs> which is kind of funny farmland, you know, in Fort Lauderdale. Uh, but my neighbor has a bunch of chickens, free range chickens, and they're just moving around, walking around, just pecking away. And, and they're really very cute. And then my other neighbor has turkeys. And I'm just laughing to myself because I'm like, yeah, those turkeys look like turkeys and those chickens look like chickens. You know, they're not pumped up with all these hormones and growth hormones and antibiotics. And then right at the top rung are the meats, meaning the red meats and the sweets. And this kind of corresponds a little bit even to the American dietary guidelines, which nobody listens to anymore. When it comes to sweets, that's the other thing that we Americans like. We really love our sweets. And, you know, we're supposed to be eating less than, you know, five to 10% of our intake should be coming from sweets. But unfortunately, um, we're really overdoing that. This is just a comparison that, that I like to put up. There are lots of different healthy diets. So the TLC diet, uh, ju that just stands for therapeutic lifestyle change. The DASH diet, dietary approaches to stop hypertension and the Mediterranean diet. And they're very similar in the sense that they're still gonna promote fruits, vegetables, and whole grains really as the base. Um, low fat dairy. So this is a little bit different in the Mediterranean diet. Um, lean meats, poultry, and fish, they kind of clump that together on the TLC diet and the DASH diet. Uh, nuts, seeds, and legumes. Um, they're saying four to five servings per day for the TLC diet. And this is interesting. The DASH diet actually counts it as a vegetable. Um, I think that's kind of strange. Um, and the Mediterranean diet wants us to eat them daily, which a lot of us do eat nuts and seeds daily. But again, unfortunately, we overdo it. So this is just a comparison. I think all three of these um, diets are healthy. I think still, I think Mediterranean diet and I think DASH diet and Mediterranean diet are pretty neck and neck in terms of me as a nutritionist, what I think is the healthiest diets. All right, so what are the basics? Okay, so obviously fruits and veggies, nuts and seeds, whole grains, seafood. What's interesting is that even though the seafood is the predominant protein source, they're really saying just eat it twice a week. And this is actually um, the American Heart Association uh, recommendation as well. And olive oil is the actual predominant oil. And it's very interesting because um, for a while, coconut oil was like the hot thing. And I think it's because everybody's following the keto diet. So they were doing coconut oil. Coconut oil still is not endorsed by the American Heart Association as a heart healthy oil. So if you do use coconut oil, just, you know, use it sparingly. Um, also, when you look at different countries that use coconut oil as their predominant oil source, like the Caribbean, unfortunately, the Caribbean has very high rates of heart disease. So I would still stick to the olive oils. Nut oils are good too, but again, we're just talking about the Mediterranean diet, so they're really encouraging olive oil. We're supposed to be eating these in moderation, uh, poultry, eggs, yogurt, and cheese. So again, that's higher up in the, in the rung. So if you're doing fish twice a week, maybe you can do poultry you know, for one of the meals and then maybe the rest of the meals can be vegetarian. You know, Maybe that's something that you can consider. 
red meat, eat rarely. That's like a special occasion, you know, maybe a Christmas time, you're having a rib roast or something. So it's not something that they're, they're promoting as an everyday thing. And that again is different than the American diet because we like our meat. Um, hopefully we can avoid, now this says avoid, right? Which means don't eat them. I know that's not realistic in the real world. Although if we can really minimize processed foods, that would be great refined grains, you know, and this one's hard for me. I'll, I'll be honest with you. I'm Korean. So I eat white rice. That's a refined grain, you know, and so I still have to incorporate culture in there too. Trans fats, there is nothing good about trans fats. Absolutely nothing. Uh, and this usually corresponds with processed foods. So if you get rid of processed foods, you're going to get rid of trans fats. What's nice now is at least the food labels will tell you if that product has trans fat. So if you're looking at a food label and it has trans fat and it's higher than zero, put it down. Refined oils, that would be more of like the safflower oils, the, um, the vegetable oils, the corn oils, and then the processed meats. And what's interesting, there is a, there was a study that I read that, that kind of correlated the, in this particular group. Um, the more processed meats they ate, like deli meat and, you know, cold cuts and luncheon meats, the higher the risk of diabetes. I thought that was pretty interesting. You got to think about what these processed meats are. Again, they have a lot of preservatives. They might have some nitrites and nitrates, which are actually cancer causing agents. Um, they might be high in salt. Um, they might have gums in them. So they're not all that great. If you really wanted some turkey, maybe make your own turkey breast and now you have your turkey. Although that's poultry, so we can't eat too much of that. And then um, also uh, for the wine, they're actually recommending one glass every day, which is five ounces, which is actually less than the American guidelines for men. The American guidelines say that men can have two glasses of five ounces and women have one. But here we even the playing field. So whether you're a male or a female, you can have one glass and preferably red wine, just because we know the red wines have more of the flavonoids and the resveratrol and a lot of the antioxidants. Red wine has been shown to increase something called HDL and the HDL stands for high density lipoprotein. That's the good cholesterol. That's very protective for your heart. And that's why a lot of my cardiologist friends say, yeah, you should let your patient have a glass of wine even though, you know, <laughs> I'm kind of against alcohol. So just be careful. Um, coffee, which is interesting. They're, they're saying to not drink too much of it, but certainly you can still include coffee and tea and of course water. So these would be your th three and a half beverages. Okay, so really what do we drink? What's the American way of drinking? We're drinking juice, we're drinking diet soda, we're drinking regular soda, we're drinking carbonated beverages. Um, who knows what else we're drinking? There's, there's a whole beverage aisle. This is the only country I've ever been to that actually has a whole beverage aisle. It almost seems wrong, right? You've got, I mean, on one side it's great, but on the other side, it, are, those the, are those healthy beverages? I mean, I know that we had a beverage lecture, so, there's a time and place for certain beverages. So if you're playing tennis or golf, you're sweating, maybe some electrolytes, right? Some Gatorade Zero or maybe some Gatorade, but you're using that with a purpose. When I see shopping carts of moms shopping for their kids or grandkids, and I see a bunch of Gatorade for their kids, all I keep thinking is, wow, I hope your kid is playing soccer and that's why you're getting the Gatorade. You know, things like that should not be used as beverages. They should be used with a purpose, okay? Same thing with a lot of these sugar substitutes. And again, I know I say some controversial things as a nutritionist, I'm really supposed to stay neutral and say, look, sugar substitutes are regarded as safe by the FDA. There are lots of different sugar substitutes, you know, Splenda and Stevia and, you know, sweet and low. But I, I would, you know, read the research. When you read the research, I think I think we should be limiting all of those things, okay? And then of course, vegetable, um, fruit juices. Fruit juices are just way too high in sugar. I'd rather you just eat a piece of fruit. That would be better. All right, so what vegetables do we really focus on? All right, all vegetables are good for us, all of them, okay? And we're gonna talk about really specific ones, but 
Green leafy vegetables, we know those are just power packed. They're power packed with a bunch of antioxidants. You know, so even if there's only one green leafy that you like, like spinach or romaine lettuce, okay, incorporate that as much as you can. Cruciferous vegetables are the ones that are stinky when you cook them. And they're stinky because of the sulfur in them, but it actually <laughs> is very healthy for you. So if you can stand the smell, broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cauliflower, those are also really, really great for us, for our health. Tubers are good. I know that potatoes get a bad rap, but let me tell you, potatoes can be healthy. The problem is white potatoes are boring. So we put a lot of stuff on it. We put bacon and sour cream and butter and we have to just douse it with stuff because it's boring so maybe we can think of other ways to cook boring white potatoes you see i'm also half british so i love potatoes i'll eat a potato right out of the pot but the korean the asian way to make potatoes is you put lots of different spices on it you know it's like a spicy potato it's just so nice so it doesn't have extra calories and extra fat so i think we should just be a little bit more inventive maybe with our cooking technique you know there's, there's nothing wrong with putting sriracha on a potato. Go for it. White veggies are good too. I know I have some clients that say, look, I don't eat white. Well, well why not? Cauliflower is white. Cucumbers are white. Onions are white. Garlic is white. Eggplant's white. Those are all really, really good vegetables for you. And then the squashes, what's really nice is that there's a wide abundance of squashes, um, it, it just even in the general supermarket, acorn squashes, butternut squash, zucchini. And these are really easy to grow in the garden. Uh, acorn squash, especially zucchini. You know, these are easy to grow. So even if you have a small little patio, I don't know, maybe starting a little garden in a pot, go for it. What's nice about acorn squash too is when you harvest it, it, it lives like forever. And it's not because it's shellacked like my tomatoes. Um, it just has a very hard out, outside covering. So you can keep it in the fridge for you know quite a few weeks and it'll still be good. All right, so all fruits are good for us too, but which fruits are really promoted in diet? Well, the berries, you know, we know berries are power packed with antioxidants. But the other reason why we focus on berries is that they're very sweet, but they're very low in glycemic index. So it happens to be lower in sugar. So that's good. Um, if you're going to eat fruit, eat the whole fruit, you know, a whole apple, a whole um, peach, a whole, you know, pear. Um, bananas are good too. I count bananas kind of like a starch. So, you know, kind of, again, the serving size of a banana might be about four inches. So when you go pick your bananas or get your bananas from the store, make sure you do the smaller ones, not the ones that look like they're three times the size. Citrus fruits, of course, are all good. And then the melons. All right. So why is the Mediterranean diet so plant focused? It's plant focused because of a theory called phytotherapy, which is not really a theory. What it is, is we know that plants have things called phytochemicals. Um, and these phytochemicals actually can prevent diseases and they can also treat certain diseases. And when we say diseases, we're talking about nutrition related diseases like cancer and heart disease, et cetera, et cetera. So this one you're probably familiar with, the carotenoids, right? The carotenes and the carotenoids, but there are others. There are polyphenols, phenolic acids, flavonoids, stillbens, lignans. I mean, look at all these crazy words. I think I even have a flow chart here. Yeah, there you go. Look, so these are the phytochemicals and all the different categories of phytochemicals. I mean, how beautiful is this? That, that's why nature is just so amazing. So plants are going to be giving you all of these different compounds, sometimes even the pigment, just the way the plant looks actually confers. So if you look at, say, green leafy vegetables, we're saying, yeah, those are the best because they have that that carotenoid in it compared to maybe, you know, a cauliflower, which is good too, but it, it might have less carotenoid in it. So that's, that's what all these fancy words are. These are the chemicals that are found in plants that actually confer health and reduce the risk of cancer and heart disease and stroke and Alzheimer's, et cetera, et cetera. These are all the things that these polyphenols are supposed to do. 
And they do. There's a lot of research on it. And that's why there's even been research to compare the health of vegetarians versus people that aren't vegetarians. I mean, even the, the whole Dean Ornish diet, the Dean Ornish diet is a pretty strict vegetarian diet, but he showed, he's a doctor, he showed that you can reverse heart disease just by your diet. But it is a very strict diet. So I know that we have to keep things realistic. Um, so if you can't be strictly vegetarian, because I know I couldn't, um, I think the second option would be just try to eat as many of these things as you can in your diet. Definitely eat the colors of the rainbow. You know, tomatoes, except my shellac ones, pink grapefruit, watermelon, cherries, other red fruits. Now, why is red so cool? Well, it's my favorite color. But red has um, a carotenoid called lycopene. And lycopene has been studied extensively and has been shown to reduce the risk of prostate cancer and lung cancer and also heart disease. So that's just fabulous. Um, it's also good for your eyes as well. One glass of tomato juice supplies about 50% of the recommended lycopene intake. Well, I'd rather you eat the tomato instead. Um, plus a lot of the tomato juice might have some salt. So if you're going to do the tomato juice, please do low sodium. Otherwise you're kind of, you know, you're getting the bad salt with the good carotenoid. It doesn't seem to make sense. Yellow and green, that's also my favorite color too. So spinach, uh, collard greens. And if you've never had these other greens, you cook them the same way. You really do. They do almost taste, they have a similar taste profile, although some of them might be a little more earthy or grassy, <laughs> which I kind of like. Um, but it's all about how you cook it and the spices and, and what you put in it. Um, mustard greens, amazing. Those are so good. Turnip greens. Um, corn gets a bad rap, but you know what? I think corn is a whole grain. It can be very healthy. I think one of the problems with corn is that it's one of the highest uh, genetically modified food products. So if you can find a farm and get some organic corn, uh, it's so sweet. It's just amazing. Peas are amazing food. Peas are also even considered a prebiotic. It helps the microbes in your own intestines. So green peas, really good for us. Um, avocado, which I know is really hot here in Florida. Um, honeydew melons, those are just really, really great. So these contain a different type of carotenoid. And this carotenoid is called lutein and zeaxanthin. And this is really, really good for your eyes. It reduces the risk of cataracts. And I have cataracts. I have early onset cataracts. I've already had cataract surgery in one of my eyes. Um, it also helps to reduce age-related macular degeneration as well. Now, remember, macular degeneration is, is a terrible, terrible blindness uh, where you can see peripherally, but you can't see central. So it's, it's a terrible disease. So if we can reduce some of that oxidative damage that occurs inside our body and really hurts our eyes by eating some spinach and collard greens, man, that, that's just worth it. It also helps to reduce atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is the beginning of heart disease. It's that buildup of fatty plaque. And what's interesting is that atherosclerosis just doesn't happen overnight. It's happening over time. And the saddest thing is that we're actually seeing seven, eight, nine, ten 10-year-olds with atherosclerosis. Ay, ay, ay. What's going to happen if they make it to 35? What's going to happen? The other color that's beautiful, of course, is the oranges, right? So the carrots. I have some clients say to me, oh, carrots have too much sugar. Well, no, actually, they're pretty low in the glycemic index um, because of the very high fiber. You'd have to eat like 10 pounds all at once to actually really affect. Um, so carrots are really good for us. Mangoes, still a, be careful with mangoes, though, just because they are very sweet. Apricots, cantaloupes, pumpkin, all these squashes. So again, this has another type of carotene called alpha carotene. And this has, has been shown to protect us against cancer. What's nice is that these orange fruits and vegetables actually have beta carotene and beta carotene actually converts to vitamin A. Vitamin A is necessary for our body for lots of things. So vitamin A protects our immunity. It's an antioxidant. 
It protects our mucous membranes, so it keeps those membranes really healthy in our respiratory tract. So remember some of those diseases with the respiratory diseases, so you really want that vitamin A. Um, it also helps our skin. Uh, it helps our intestines. Uh, it's good for our vision. So it's really nice that we can actually make a vitamin from a plant. That's, that to me is just so amazing. Um, the yellow group is good too, our pineapples, um, our tangerines, well, that's orange, right? Orange and yellow group, papayas, nectarines. So these contain a pigment called beta cryptothanthin. And this actually helps to prevent heart disease. It also helps our cells of our body actually talk to each other, <laughs> which is kind of cool. Um, it's actually been shown to be, um, it kills cancer cells as well. And that's probably from the vitamin C. Vitamin C is also an antioxidant. And I'd rather you get vitamin C from food rather than supplements, right? Because there's so many other reactions that you're gonna get from the actual healthy food. So that's yummy. Don't forget about the red and purple. I know a lot of people like the beets and I think that's because of the TV commercials, but beets are very, very healthy for us. Um, they're kind of messy just because they have that, that dye. So you don't want to have a white dress and eat a beet because if that beet falls on your dress, you can forget it, it's no longer white. Um, but it's really, beets are so good for us and fresh beets roasted, oh yeah, yeah. It just, ah, oh, they're so good. Eggplant, grapes, the wine we threw in there, some grape juice. If you're going to do some grape juice, really limit it to about four to six ounces. And that's your serving of juice for the day. Prunes, cranberries, blueberries, purple cabbage, you know. So what's nice about this color, this red purple color, it's actually um, a pigment uh, that's anthocyanin. And this anthocyanin is really, really protective of our heart. And it does that by preventing blood clots. It also helps the aging process as well. So it's gonna make you look really young. Um, and it also helps our brain, helps to reduce that Alzheimer's disease. It's supposed to also improve our memory too. Beets are also um, very high in iron, which is good for our blood. So, all right, the white group. I think white is still good. Your white, your leeks, your scallions, your garlic. Okay, these have um, a chemical in them called allicin. And allicin has been studied for the anti-tumor properties. I knew of um, a client of mine, she, um, she was around a long time. She actually lived to way, way past 100. I think she was like 102, 103. And she would eat a raw garlic every morning, <laughs> every single morning. Uh, I haven't brought myself to do that yet. It's a little too strong for me. But, you know, a really great way to eat garlic is if you bake it in the oven, you know, so you take the whole head of garlic, you wrap it in foil, just like you would if you were baking a potato, maybe put a little olive oil in it and uh, bake it. And it comes out really creamy and mild. And you can use that kind of like your butter. And that's what they do in Italy. It's really nice. All right, the green group, we already know about the green group, um, broccoli, you know, that's a cruciferous vegetable as well. So it has the isocyanate. It also has the sulforaphane. This is the one that smells so bad, but it's so good for us. We already know that broccoli is good for us. It helps to reduce cancer. Um, but remember, it's not just broccoli, Brussels sprouts, cabbage, bok choy, kale. And then I threw green tea in there too, because green tea also contains um, anti-cancer and it's green. So that's why I stuck it in there. The brown and the tan. Okay, so mushrooms, dates, ginger, Jerusalem artichokes. These have um, an anti-tumor and an antibacterial component. And it has something called hypocholesterol as well. These are so healthy for us. Mushrooms are amazing. Even though it's a fungus, <laughs> you're like, okay, it's a fungus. But some mushrooms are extremely healthy for us. Um, there's studies to show that they just kill cancer cells, especially the shiitake mushrooms and the maitake mushrooms. They're just very, very healthy for us. You can buy them dried. Um, I know what, what I do personally is I, do, I go to the Asian markets and I get the dried mushrooms just because, you know, mushrooms go rotten in like a day just because they're very susceptible to that, you know, wetness. So I buy them dried. 
Um, I buy like a whole bag of shiitake mushrooms. It's kind of expensive. It's dried. So it's like $25 for the bag. It's expensive. But, you know, these dried shiitake mushrooms last me quite a while. And when I want to use them in my soups or stir fries or whatever I'm using them in, you just take some of the dried mushrooms out and you put them in water and you let them rehydrate. And then they like come to life again and they just, you know, and then they're nice and uh, pliable and soft. And there's nothing like a good tasting shiitake mushroom. I think that has to be one of my favorite foods. The other thing about um, grains, now remember grains are plant foods, right? So try to avoid if you can, some of the refined grains, even though I say that with a chuckle because I'm probably gonna have some white rice tonight. Um, but the whole grain is the best, right? Because the grain, it's what I'm eating when I'm eating white rice is just this inner starchy stuff. It gives me some carbohydrate, gives me some energy, but really it doesn't give me too many vitamins or minerals. It doesn't give me any fiber. So if you're doing brown rice or brown pasta, that would be better. 100% whole grain. That's just better just because it has the bran, it has the endosperm, um, sorry, it has the germ, and that is really good for us. Maybe even just going back to putting some wheat germ in your oatmeal or in your soups, or maybe you know use it as breading. You know, you can be kind of inventive. And the other thing too is remember, I think we had a lecture on this quite a few years ago, but remember, try to go with ancient grains too. It doesn't always have to be rice. Maybe doing things like amaranth and barley and farro. I mean, we're just so fortunate to live where we live because you can, we have access to these grains. Um, I have so many clients and friends from the Middle East and they're like, you know, we don't eat this plain rice. That's boring. They're, e they're eating spelt and farro and teff and frika. They're eating all these exotic ancient grains and it's wonderful. And honestly, it's easy to cook. I have a rice cooker. You stick everything in a rice cooker. <laughs> and if you don't have a rice cooker, you cook it very similarly as you would rice. It's just that sometimes you have to play around with the fluid. Sometimes you have to add more fluid. Sometimes you have to add less fluid. But if you like to cook, it's all about having fun in the kitchen. All right, so we know seafood is a part of the Mediterranean diet. Not all seafood is created equal. You really want to get the seafood that has the greatest amount of omega-3s. You know, so that's why when you're in Italy, you can get, you know, wild, you know, herring <laughs> and farm. This is farm-raised salmon, um, king salmon, mackerel and then tuna. So these are actually the four that have the greatest amount per three ounces of omega-3s, but it doesn't mean that tuna is not good for us. It's good for us too. So I think, you know, most seafood is good for us. You just want to get bang for your buck if you can. And remember that there are plant-based omega-3s as well. Now, omega-3s are good for us. Um, the fish oils and things from the fish, our body can really use readily plant-based omega-3s, our body kind of has to convert them, but that's okay too. So the nuts have omega-6s and omega-3s, the seeds, the whole grains, the soy. Don't forget about your beans. There are so many different kinds of beans out there. I'm always pushing seaweed. I think it's a vegetable that you should really try. Um, all right, it's, it's an acquired taste, but once you acquire it, you'll really like it. And then even those green leafy vegetables that we talked about also have a type of omega-3 called ALA. And this ALA can actually be converted. So really good stuff. All right, so even the cabbage family. So as you can see here, what's nice is that when you have Brussels sprouts, right, or broccoli or cauliflower, you're getting the cabbage family, which is the cruciferous. So you're getting the sulforaphane and you're getting the indols, but you're also getting the omega-3s. <laughs> so you really get bang for your buck. And this is what I look for when I'm eating food. You know, it's just the way I think. I'm trying to get the most nutrition I can from the food that we eat. So it's all about quality, not quantity, right? When you're eating berries, great. If you're picking berries, that's a great form of fruit for you to have because it's low glycemic index, it's fiber, it's got antioxidants, it's purple. So it has the purple anthocyanins. But look at this, it even has omega-3s. <laughs> so how great is that? So this is why these foods are really promoted on the Mediterranean diet. And don't forget your herbs and spices too. Um, they're plant-based. <laughs> Remember, they're plants. So you're going to get 
nutrition from these herbs and spices. Just remember, though, if you have spice mixes, a lot of those spice mixes are mixed with salt. So that you do have to be careful. Just read the food label. You're better off just making mixes yourself. You know, a little bit here, a little bit there. Make your own mix. Flax seeds um, are pretty nice. Uh, it is top of the list as the best vegetarian source of omega-3, but, and I'm sure you know this already, just remember that the actual seed, you need to crush it in order to get the benefit of the omega-3. Now, if you eat flax seeds whole, which is good too, you're gonna get fiber and it's probably gonna come out the way it went in. OK, so if you really want to get the benefit of the flax seeds and you want to get the lignans and you want to get the omega threes, you really do need to crush them. I suggest crushing them yourself when you buy a bag of ground flax seeds. Um, sometimes the, the it's not as um, potent because it's already crushed. So it's better if you do it yourself. But look at this. One ounce of flax seeds has over six thousand milligrams of omega three. That's pretty incredible. Chia seeds are cool too. Yes, it comes from the chia pet. So you can, you know, grow some chia seeds and have some microgreens on the side too. So there you go, you're growing your own food. But one ounce of chia seeds contains over 4,000 milligrams of omega-3. And what's nice about chia seeds is you don't have to crush them. You can actually get the benefit of the omega-3 if you eat them whole. What's interesting about chia seeds though, is it does become kind of gelatinous. Um, that used to be a pretty hot thing too. People were putting chia seeds in milk or pudding. It's almost like a tapioca kind of thickness. Um, so if you like that, that sort of consistency, go for it. Hemp seeds are good too. Um, they, a lot of cereals now contain these hemp seeds. They provide over a thousand milligrams of omega-3. Mustard seeds. Now, mustard seeds would be something that you might cook with, especially if you like Mediterranean food, Moroccan food, curries, things like that. Um, mustard seeds, uh, the actual mustard oil, which I don't often see. I'll tell you the truth. I don't see the oil. I do see the seeds. Um, but mustard oil has 826 milligrams of omega-3. All right, so going back to your nuts, I know you've seen this chart before. I think I always put almonds here because that's the most eaten uh, nut. Um, but remember, only one ounce, one ounce over 163 calories. So they are very high in calories. So if you're playing cards and you got that bowl of nuts over there, please just make sure you're measuring out one ounce and that's what you get for your card game because they can be very high in fat. And remember, fat is still fat, calories are still calories. So you really want to still control it. Uh, one ounce is the recommended serving on the Mediterranean diet, preferably almonds. Brazilian nuts I threw in there. That's not really the Mediterranean diet, but I threw that one in there because remember, it's high in selenium. So it's an antioxidant. It's very good for your blood and it's good for your thyroid gland. So I kept that one in there. All right, avocado. I know people go crazy over the avocado toast. Um, probably, again, the best thing to do is make your own avocado toast. Don't buy the avocado that's already smashed up in a package because then it's processed. So if you can, try to cut one up yourself. Um, avocados are very healthy for us. It's a plant. It's got fiber. It's got a little bit of protein, but remember, it's got all those omega-3s. What's really nice about it, too, is it has folic acid, very high in folic acid, which is good for our blood. It's good for our heart. So nearly 20 vitamins and minerals and phytonutrients. So yes, it is a powerhouse. Go for it. Very good. Um, but a serving size, it's not the whole avocado. <laughs> and, you know, it almost seems a shame when you cut it, you want to eat the whole thing. Or maybe I'm just speaking for myself. But if you do save half of it, maybe you can just sprinkle a little bit of uh, lemon juice on it so it doesn't oxidize and turn brown on you because then nobody wants to eat a brown avocado when it's supposed to be green. Um, that brownness is just that oxidation, but it does create an off flavor as well. So maybe just sprinkle a little bit of uh, lemon juice on it, put it in a baggie and put it in the fridge. And maybe that could be tomorrow's serving. Just wanted to do a comparison of some of these healthy things. So you've got your salmon, which is part of the Mediterranean diet. You got the olive oil that's part of the American uh, Mediterranean diet. And then you've got the avocado. And when you look at some of the omegas, 
still the salmon, this is going to be the most because it is fish. So that has the most because this is a plant and this is a plant. It's going to have the ALA. This ALA is the type of omega-3 that gets converted to actually omega-3. <laughs> okay. So that's, that's just a comparison. So my point with this chart is these three items are part of a Mediterranean diet and they're healthy because you're going to get your omega-3s from them. All right, I do like to mention ginger. And I think the reason why I love ginger so much is because I grow it and it's the easiest thing to grow. So I just have to tell you. So if you wanna start a mini little garden and just start with ginger, you're not gonna be a failure because it just grows crazy. So you have to go to like maybe Whole Foods or an Asian market to buy the ginger because the ginger at Publix, I don't know what they do with it. It's just dead, it doesn't, doesn't do anything. So when you buy this ginger, you keep it, um, like in a little baggie, don't close it, but keep it in a baggie, maybe for a couple of days. And you're gonna see these little eyes develop. It's almost like, you know, when you keep a potato on the counter and they start growing these eyes. <laughs> well, those eyes means that it's gonna grow. Once you see those little eyes, all you need to do is stick it in dirt, that's it. And you stick it down maybe two inches in nice good soil, you know, nice potting soil, not topsoil, nice potting soil, and just stick it there. And then you'll see in a matter of a couple of weeks, you're going to have this green plant come growing out of that pot. It's amazing. And when you see that, what the ginger is actually doing, because the ginger is a rhizome, it's not really a root. What it does is it starts to elongate. So what I do is I take little pieces of ginger with these eyes. I think I put like five of them in dirt. And I ended up with like two pounds of ginger. It was so fun. And what's nice is that the plant is very aromatic. It's very pretty. It's green. It's just lovely. And you can even use the leaves in your cooking as well. So if you're, you know, want to have some fun and just grow your own things, this, this is really fun. It doesn't require a lot of space. So I think it's just fun. And ginger is just so good for us. Ginger actually has a component, it's called shogol, and it actually blocks the inflammation process. And as we know, a lot of disease is linked to inflammation, especially heart disease. So if you can tolerate ginger, make tea out of it, put it in your cereal, in your oatmeal, you know, um, make, make your stews, whatever, put it in everything. It's just, it's just awesome. Oh, there's some tea. There you go. Cinnamon is really good too. Now remember, this is a spice, it's a plant, it's a bark actually. And it has this um, chemical in it called cinnamaldehyde and cinnamonic acid. And we know that cinnamon actually helps to control blood sugar, which is nice, although you'd have to eat a lot of it. Um, but cinnamon also helps to inhibit cell damage from free radicals. And remember, free radicals are just the natural, you know, we can induce more free radicals by certain behaviors. But even if we had the perfect lifestyle, we're still going to create free radicals because it's a it's a product of metabolism. So the problem is the free radicals are obnoxious and they start to attach to cells and break up cell membranes. And then that becomes a problem. So the more antioxidants that you can eat, the better it is because now the free radicals attach to the antioxidant instead of the cells. So put cinnamon in everything, put it in your coffee, put it in your oatmeal, put it in your, you know, I mean, when you look at some of these cultures, they're putting cinnamon in food, right? They're putting it in their rice pilaf and they're putting it in the chili. And so go crazy with it. It's so good. Garlic, we know, we kind of mentioned this already, but this is what it has. It has the organo, uh, organosulfur compounds and the crescetin, the flavonoids, saponin. So it's just really, really good for us. So this is just a sample menu plan of a Mediterranean diet. And it's not mine. I stole it from the internet. So that's why I have the reference right here if you wanted to take a look at it. But this would be a typical Mediterranean-like diet. Okay, so Monday, you're having some Greek yogurt with some strawberries and maybe some oatmeal. Lunch, you're having a whole grain sandwich, but you're having some vegetables, right? You're always sticking those veggies there. For dinner, maybe you're having some tuna salad dressed in olive oil with a piece of fruit for dessert. Okay, so even though that sounds boring, the whole point is these are the foods that will be part of the Mediterranean diet. Okay, so Tuesday, you're having some oatmeal, now you're having some leftovers, maybe you're having some salad with some, uh, all right, we're going to stick a little bit of feta cheese in there, right? 
Um, then for breakfast, we're having an omelet. So when you look at a menu like this, it's still a variety of foods, right? But it's not overdoing on anything, if you ask me. It's pretty healthy. Okay, so what I did was I taught my patient how to mind map. And mind mapping just means that we kind of make a picture depiction of what foods he liked and what would actually be part of a Mediterranean diet. So instead of, you know, when a doctor or nutritionist says to you, okay, list me the foods that you like. Okay, well, we did it kind of a little bit different. We drew a picture, you know, just graphically, and it just makes more sense that way. And we were able to look at which foods he liked in all these different categories, and then we created a menu together. So this was this is what we ended up with. Uh, and this was nice because it was based on foods that he ate. So I wasn't just picking foods randomly and he'd look at me like, well, I don't eat that stuff. I don't even know how to cook it. So he was having his oatmeal. He had, he had a little bit of milk. He had his mixed berries. Great, he's got his berries, he's got his whole grain. And then he didn't drink coffee. He drank black tea. I tried to get him to drink green tea, but he wasn't going for it. And then for lunch, he had four, four ounces of broiled chicken breast. Um, he decided that he was going to be adventurous and have some steamed barley. <laughs> so instead of having rice, he had steamed barley. I showed him how to use his rice cooker. And then he had a green salad and then he had some water. He did have a snack. He had some more tea, but he did throw in a whole, a whole fruit. So he had an apple. And then dinner, he had some salmon. He decided, all right, I'm not going to be adventurous for dinner. I'm going to have some brown rice. I'm going to have some spinach. And then he had his water and he had his almonds. So look at all of these foods. It's all part of a Mediterranean diet. And he's just, this, this was actually a client patient of mine that actually needed to lose weight. And he also had um, history of heart disease as well. So I can tell you he's doing very, very well. And what was it? Re and this is this is the mind map. This is how we did it. So I said, OK, let's just draw a picture. Tell me what you like to drink. Tell me what you like to eat. So we just kind of I had like this little template and he would tell me what kind of fish and seafood. He only likes salmon. He likes he liked chicken breast. You know, so what I did was I just created these categories and he just threw in what kinds of foods he liked. And then we put him in a menu and it was just fun. It was just fun to do. So maybe that's something you might want to try. So really, what's the take home message with this Mediterranean diet? Yes, I do believe it is one of the healthiest diets, definitely. Um, even if you like your chicken and you want to eat chicken more than once a week, that could be OK, too. But try to look at the other things then, maybe increase some whole grains, maybe increase your vegetables, maybe be adventurous. If you've never had Swiss chard before, try it. You know, hey, if it's on the menu at the at the club, maybe have it, try it. Um, definitely be physical, be social, definitely be happy. I know times are rough sometimes, do the best we can. Um, definitely go for your wellness checkups. I know I always push that. The reason why I always push that is because we even know with this COVID, people weren't going for their checkups. And then by the time they're actually coming out to get their checkups, now they already have a devastating condition that really could have been treated earlier. So that's why I'm saying, you know, moving forward, always go for your wellness checkups. It's just really important. All right, so that's the end of my presentation. And of course, my dogs always say hello and thank you. All right, so what questions do you have? Comments? Nothing. I have a question as always. Oh, tell me. Oh, tell me. Is this Anne? Yes. Hi, Anne. Hi. I even have my husband Vince with me. Hi, Vince. How you doing? He's the cook. Oh, it's nice to see you both. And I wanted to make sure he saw these things. <laughs> um, one of the things we have a lot of uh, too, maybe once a week, um, bell peppers. Mm -hmm. um, not not the green ones. I can't eat those. Right. But the red, the yellow, and the um, orange. Beautiful, beautiful. But they are not mentioned on your list at all. Um, but they are still good because they're still orange, yellow, <laughs> orange, right. yellow, and red. So it's still going to contain those carotenoids. So go for it. Absolutely. All right. And the other thing is, uh, one of the fish that we have, you know, we have fish usually twice plus shrimp. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. now yeah, what's interesting about shrimp, shrimp, even though it's high in cholesterol, it's very low in fat. So it's actually a very good shellfish. Um, and the pink shrimp actually contain a pigment 
that actually um, is an antioxidant. So every once in a while, if you can get those Key West shrimp, you're actually mm -hmm. getting a bonus. So try to go for those. But shrimp is actually a very good food. It's a good protein. It is part of the Mediterranean diet. You are going to get omega-3s from it. It's not going to be as much as salmon, but you're still going to get omega-3s. So it's still a very good food. Go for it. Um, could you put that slide up about, is it, it had the menus on it. It was at the third from the last or something sure. like that. I want to, I want to get that. Cause I was that, trying- oh, that one? That one. Uh, uh, yeah, the sample menu. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'm going to get, I'm going to get it. Because I was doing some research online the other day, mm -hmm. and what I was looking for was, you know, the different kinds of menus, and mm -hmm. and I think like like the I'm just looking at Monday, and that, you know, those were those were pretty good, and so mm -hmm. I, that's what I'm looking for the menus. Awesome. Is, awesome. There, an, is there another one after Wednesday? Um. Thursday, uh, Friday. Do you see the Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday? No, you've got it on. You've got your. Uh, oh, sorry about slide. that. There we Hit go. The full, full screen. Is that better? Oh, okay. Full screen. Um, is that better? There you go. Oh, That's yes. what I'm looking for. Okay. There you go. There Thank we you. Go. You're very welcome. All right. What else? Oh, Any yes. other questions, yes. comments? Yes. Tell me. I mean we like swordfish. Yeah, swordfish. Um, swordfish, just because it's an endangered species, <clears throat> I'm away from it. But swordfish, um, yeah, the thing with swordfish that I've been told is that because <laughs> it's a larger fish, that it tends to be more contaminated with mercury. Yeah. So maybe once in a while, go for it. How's oh, that? have it twice a month mm. all right how about reduce it to once a month <laughs> get for, for dinner tonight <laughs> <laughs> it's still a good fish though it's it's good for protein it's good for omega-3s um and again it, it just the bigger the fish the more contaminated with mercury oh. yeah i guess we have to go for branzino <laughs> there you go go with the branzino yep Thank you. Uh, tilapia. Now, tilapia is a freshwater uh, farm raised fish, um, but it is very good with protein. It just doesn't have a lot of omega threes, just because it's a freshwater fish. Um, but it, um, I think the farming technique has gotten better. Let's put it that way. It's gotten better, so you're still going to get benefit from it. Because I look at it this way, you know, some people say to me, look, I don't like salmon. I don't like fishy fish. I like white fish, you know, things that are white. Okay, well, I'd rather you have the tilapia than not have it at all, because I think you're still going to get some benefit from it. So go for it. How do you make it? You don't make it fried, do you? No. <laughs> okay, good. No. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Um, what about, you know, the, the fruits and smoothies? Yeah. So, you know, with smoothies, remember my only, my only comment about smoothies is remember we lose track of how much fruit we're putting in the smoothie a lot of times, or if we go to, you know, places like Smoothie King and things like that, before you know it, you have this beverage <laughs> that has hundreds of calories and a greater majority of that is sugar. So just be really careful of that. That's all. I think I calculated once one of my um, patients, his, the calories was craziness. It was like 300 or 400 calories, but the sugar was like 72 grams. It was very, very high. So even though, even though they thought that they were having something really healthy, you know, hey, ice cream has less. It was almost, <laughs> not that I told her to go have an ice cream sundae, but it just had a lot of sugar in it. So that's why I'd really rather you eat the fruit rather than blend the fruit because you have so much more control over how much you're eating. Mm -hmm. I know that's a boring answer, but that's my answer. <laughs> not boring. It's <laughs> the satisfying answer to some yeah, people. Yeah, yeah, it's true. But what you can do then is really just measure it out. So if you want to make a smoothie in the morning, measure out your ingredients. Don't just do oh a little bit here, a little bit there. I'm going to put some blueberries, I'm going to put some strawberries, put a banana. Before you know it, it's like a fruit cocktail inside a beverage. 
So measure things out. So then you have more control and say, okay, I'm going to use half a cup of fruit. And the half a cup is going to be a mixture of blueberries and mango and banana and whatever. But now you know you only have half a cup of fruit in there. So it's more controlled because the half a cup of fruit would, is not going to have 72 grams of sugar in it and be counterproductive of what you're trying to do. So the grams of sugar, if I recall, 25 for women and how much for men? Yeah, 38, 35. Yeah. 35. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. It's just, it's hard. It's really hard. Another way to do it, if you really wanted to be exact for you, is just do, and we'll go on the higher end, do 10% of your calories. So just say you eat 1200 calories. I have a calculator here. I kept it just in case. Okay. That would mean if you have a 1200 calorie diet and you're trying to keep your sugar to 10%, just like the you know dietary guidelines tell us, that means you can have 30 grams of sugar per day. Thank you. You're welcome. Now, if you wanted to go according to the World Health Organization, though, it's actually even less. So let's see. Um, mm, the World Health Organization says 15 grams per day. But I got to tell you, that's kind of unrealistic. You have one piece of fruit and you just blew it. And remember, yeah. almost everything has sugar. Even, you know, even broccoli will have a little bit of sugar in it. So 10% is more realistic. Yep. Okay. All right. Awesome. That was fun, you guys. Thank you so much for attending. I always have such a good time. Um, I think next month we're going to talk about good nutrition and sleep. I think, you know, sleep is, un is really is really important for our health. So we're going to talk about foods that are good for sleep and foods that are bad for sleep. <laughs> okay. All right, you guys. Really have, really oh, I'm glad you enjoyed it. I enjoyed it too. Thanks a lot, you guys. Be safe. Okay. I'll see you next month. Thanks, Lillian. Appreciate Welcome. it. Thank you, everyone. Appreciate you being here. <laughs>